Hi everybody, uh, welcome to BIM Brighton. Um, we're going to have a little webinar about DIY for the modern songwriter. Um, Brighton is a brilliant, brilliant city, arguably uh, Britain's most, well probably second most after London important city. Um, with me I've got a one woman cottage industry called Danny Wilde who is a, a brilliantly talented um, blues singer, musician, writer and uh, we're going to be talking through. Now please, please, please get your questions in um, early because we're going to try and do this in about 15 minutes. So I'm going to speed up. Uh, try and do this in about 15 minutes. And Danny, yeah. your turn. You're meant to introduce me. I, I'm going to. Um, and this is Martin Rossiter, who um, is or was front man of the band Gene. He sold a million records and then came to BIM as a head of songwriting um, and is currently writing music for TV as yes, well. indeed. Okay, so Danny, for this, you're, you're the talent, right? Tell me, um, I mean, you've built a really successful career. Uh, what characteristics do you have that have made that possible? What sort of personality traits? And where do you need help? Okay, I think determination, um, being friendly and approachable, and then having social confidence are all really um, important. And that's because um, networking is is really the basis for, for every opportunity yeah. that you're going to get in the industry um, and that means you need to make a really good first impression mm -hmm. and, and i know musicians who are wonderful who aren't who aren't so good at that um, and i've not always been so good at it either but if you're a really friendly approachable person then opportunities are going to come your way um, and even if you're shy um, but if it translates wrong, if you come across as moody because you're shy, like a, a good yeah. friend of mine, he's a wonderful musician, um, but it comes across the wrong way, and so you're not going to get the same kind of opportunities then. So you need to be positive, friendly, and speak to loads of people at, at gigs and so on, make contacts. Okay. I mean, it, it, it's very true. I mean, I, I once had a conversation with a music publisher. We tried to, um, drunkenly tried to define mm -hmm. networking, and we uh, came across this definition, which was meeting people without being a beep. Um, yeah, and I, I think that, that's, that's very true. Um, yeah. Uh, anything else in there? I mean, are there any things you're bad at? Yeah, well, um, I don't think I come across as a, as a horrible negative person, right, but right. I can be quite a shy person, mm -hmm. especially if I'm starstruck. Um, so when I've had opportunities to be on the same bill as people like Coco Taylor and Bobby Womack and on the blues wow. soul industry, I've, I've not spoken to them. I've been stood in a lift with Bobby Womack, completely in awe and unable to say anything to him. And, and I think He was probably gutted, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> I was gutted afterwards yeah. because it's just missed opportunities. Um, whereas when I have spoken to people, and I bumped into Jules Holland's brother in a venue in Brighton mm -hmm. b before I was a signed artist, and I got talking to him and I ended up opening for Jules at the Royal Albert Hall because of a conversation that wow. I'd had at the uh, little venue in Brighton when I was a student at BIM, in fact. So it's... That's making that, a I mean good that, impression, yeah, not that, messing that's up. Very, that's very, very <laughs> impressive. Um, in terms of, I mean, obviously you've had a, what, 10, 11, 12 year career, we're talking? Maybe yeah, even longer? Yeah. You don't look old 10, enough. 10, um, 12 years, yeah. How have you, what have you done to build your fan base over time? Um, I started out um, as an unsigned mm -hmm. artist, and I think it's really important for young artists to start getting a, a buzz going, especially in Brighton, because that's so easy to do. It's such a great musical community. There's so many resources here um, at BIM and in the city. Once you've got that buzz going, you're building a fan base, that's when record labels and managers and people who might invest in you start to become interested. So for me, it was getting to the point where I had three songs mm -hmm. recorded that I was really proud of. Um, and doing that in Brighton, especially if you're a BIM student, is, is quite easy because if you're good at networking or if you can practice networking, yeah. you can network with all of our production students who are all wonderful at recording. So that's yeah, you know, I mean we've got job number one. 1,700 students here alone. So exactly. Yeah. So get a recording sorted. Um, promotional photos mm -hmm. is the next one. Once you've got that music, if you're going to be sending that to venues and asking for gigs, you need to, have, you need to be the full package. You need image. So look at other artists that you like, learn from them, but then create something new, something different that's all about you and your image. Um, when I was a student, again, networking, I, I remember I emailed the head of Brighton University, or the, he the head of photography, and said, oh, can, I, um, can you recommend any of your photography students to me? 
Um, and they said, yeah, sure. And actually, the girl, her name was Claire Pepper, and she was like 19 years old, and she was wonderful. Um, so we did that in Brighton. Mm -hmm. And when I got my record deal, about a year after, um, the head of the label loved her photos so much that he said, oh, no, we'll use her again. And, you know, she was chuffed because my CD with her artwork was in HMV and so on. Wow. So it was, it was lovely. Um, and then online presence was the other one. Social media, which when I started was MySpace. Yeah. And, and now, isn't, <laughs> now isn't MySpace. Um, but it's being aware um, of uh, not just of Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and so on, mm -hmm. but all the new things that come out, like when Periscope suddenly started and so on, embrace all of these, the, the, the new social media and make maximise that. Um, You've got to put the time in there, haven't you? I mean, yeah. you know, I was, we were talking before and I, I was doing, well, I had an album out five years ago and I, I was doing 20 hours a week mm -hmm. on social media. And exactly. also you've got, you, you, even if you don't like a platform, you sort of have to use it because yeah. there are people out there who pick and choose which sites they like. Yeah. So unfortunately you've got to do the, the hard work. Exactly, wix.com is amazing, W-I-X, Wix for making your own website. It's DIY. Um, a lot of our students on our degree course use it. Um, and it looks completely professional. You can, you know, if you look on Taylor Swift's website, you can then completely remake that for yourself using Wix.com. So that's a really good way of... Or maybe not Taylor Swift, but... You know. Well, wh whoever you... you know, <laughs> yeah, whoever, absolutely. Exactly. Um, so, I mean, you, you over time have you know, built up this fan mm -hmm. base. You've, you've played not, uh, you know, not only here, but in Europe, in, in America. Um, how have you, how did you start to monetize, I hate that word, but you know, <laughs> how did you start to earn some dollar? I think you've you got to be prepared initially to not make money and, and, bef and you will make money, but initially you've got to um, get that following. And I started out, I mean, in Brighton it's brilliant because you've got loads of promotion companies like Lout Promotions, mm -hmm. One Inch Badge, Melting Vinyl. If you've got your, your stuff together, if you've got your photos, your um, the online presence yeah. and so on recordings, you can send it to them and ask for, um, for gigs. And that might be at smaller venues where you're the headline act with other local bands. Mm -hmm. They can also get you massive support slots at the Concord, the Dome, and so on. So that's a good way of doing it. And support slots, for me, have been the kind of key to my success early on. Sometimes, if you're at to a venue and say, can I be the support act please for this act it might be somebody who's doing what you want to do they're a step above a comedian in Brighton for example um, often they will say sorry we've already got a support act and I used to say well can I open for the support then I don't want any money I'll just do two songs it'll just be me and my acoustic guitar please and they'll say yeah go on they don't always but well, actually more often than not if you're if you're sweet about it and they like your music yeah I mean it is worth a try I mean quite often promoters will uh, you know, put on one local act, I yeah. mean, partly to sell a few more tickets as exactly. much as anything, but suddenly you're playing in front of six, seven, eight hundred people who've mm -hmm. never heard of you, and you know, if 10% if exactly. of those people love what you do, yeah. well, 80 to 100 people yeah. find you on Facebook, maybe buy your records. For me, I looked at all of the blues, this is a blues artist, but you can relate this to whatever genre you are. Um, I looked at all of the acts, especially the American acts who were coming over, who I thought, I want to be on their record labels doing what they're doing. And I managed to blag the support slots for them mm -hmm. until their management and everybody on that scene and their labels knew who I was and then I ended up signing to, yeah, to that label. So it's a, a strategy, really. Um, in terms of, I mean, you've, you've built a career pretty much on your own. I mean, when I described you as a one-woman cottage industry, I think that's, that's really true. Maybe not even a cottage, maybe a semi-detached now. <laughs> um, are there limits to how far you can go being DIY? Um, Is there a ceiling? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I've, I've done both and I've, I've succeeded mm -hmm. at both. Um, of course, you can get online distribution using um, websites like TuneCore mm -hmm. and so on, and that's, uh, that's fantastic. So you've got a really good starting point and you can get local magazines and so on to review you go on local radio especially in brighton you can you know walk into the radio station and say please can i come in your station I'm and so on Lovely. exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. um but um when i used that when i was a student at bim many years ago 12 years ago mm -hmm. um as a big stepping stone so diy for me is a stepping stone until uh independent record label came along and said 
and took notice of the fact that I had a following, was very busy um, with my music, yeah. and they took me to the next level. And without that label, I would have found it a lot more difficult to have ended up touring the world and selling as many records as I did. Um, that being said, I know other people on the blues scene, my brother's one of them, who um, managed to forge his way there um, without a label initially. Um, so it can be done, but I think if you can get somebody to invest in what you do, it's a lot easier. You're talking about touring. Mm -hmm. you've, you, you've sometimes played over 250 gigs. So have you. Yes, I know. <laughs> but this is about you, Danny. Shush now. Uh, you've played over 250 in year, gigs yeah. in, a, in a year. Um, and as a singer, and I'm sure some of the people watching, don't forget to get your questions in. Uh, mm -hmm. as, a, as a singer, um, any advice for looking after that very precious larynx of yours? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, I learned from my own mistakes. When I first went on tour, um, I would drink alcohol. Don't do that. I would eat massive amounts of food right before the show. Don't do that. <laughs> unless, you, unless you're an Elvis impersonator. Yeah, yeah, I was used to being a, a poor student and then I got a record deal. So I was, uh, uh, you know, suddenly all this free food. <laughs> if you eat before you sing, you can't, your diaphragm's like a big spoon that scoops underneath your lungs. And when you tighten your abs, if you've taken a big breath, it makes the sound come out loud and clear with no, no strain here. Um, which we teach you at BIM. <laughs> 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 but, um, but yeah, um, if you had a big meal, you can't actually use any of this, and so the strain comes to there. If you drink alcohol, it lowers, weakens your immune system, it dries all of this out. You need to be hydrated, drink water, not whiskey, even if you're a blues singer, just, you know, despite what they may say. Um, and I used to get really ill on tours because I wasn't looking after myself. Also, having your own microphone, because microphones in venues get really germy. Oh my God, do they? Yeah. And actually, if they've been dropped on the floor too many times, they also sound terrible. So um, you, yeah, get, get your own microphone so that you don't end up with coughs and colds on tour, because it, you know, it all gets filmed and put on YouTube by fans. What a disaster. You want your tour to represent you at your very, your very best, yeah, not, not you ill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you were saying actually, because we, we talked about this a few days ago, and you were saying also that, um, that your record company w were actually worried about putting you out on tour because you used to get ill. Yeah, so it was the, the booking agency. Oh, the booking agency. Yeah, for yeah. um, Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, and to the point where th they were getting angry at me. I thought I was going to get dropped and I wouldn't be able to tour because venues have been complaining that uh, even though I've never cancelled a show, don't do that um, unless you really have to. Um, but yeah, that I was struggling through it, not able to sing because I hadn't looked after myself and having to play loads of guitar solos <laughs> to mm. make up for it. But it's not, not good. You no. need a good reputation, so take care of yourself. It, 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 is, it is true. And it, it, it sometimes, I mean, you know, some of you people watching will be, uh, you know, singers or, or you're, maybe you're a drummer, a bass player, a keyboard player, whatever. Uh, and, it, you know, I've, I've toured a lot mm -hmm. and it, it's, it's actually quite hard for singers because, you, you know, nobody else pours alcohol all over their instrument. That's you know, I, at, at the end of a gig, somebody doesn't go, I know what to do, six cans of Grolsch all over my Fender Telecaster. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you do, have to, yeah. you do have to look after I mean, we're both singers, yeah. so you have to look after and that. And it's not just that. It's also, I've, I've had friends who, um, good friends, who, um, again, have gone from student to professional musician. Um, and when you're on tour, you get a rider. So you can put a bottle of whiskey on your rider every night if you want. But if you're drinking a bottle of whiskey every night, even if you don't get ill, even if you can still sing, that's not that's not healthy. And I've known people end up with you know some some awful health problems and mental health problems because of that. Yeah. So um, you just got to be sensible, really. Okay, I think we're going to grab some questions. Ooh, so okay. I've got a I've got a screen in front of me, and things are uh, mm -hmm. doing that a lot. Well, they're not anymore. Um, we've got a question here, and it says, uh, "What's it like to be a blues musician in the 21st century?" How is blues different from what it was like before? Or is it the same? Or is it the same? Yeah, well, I think I was lucky that I got on the end of an era whereby some of my big heroes um, from back in the day were still alive. So Coco Taylor was still alive and B.B. King and to play festivals with them was amazing. Um, and, and there's not many of them left. I mean, Buddy Guy's still there. Um, yeah, I mean, even Johnny Winter's gone. But um, actually, we do have exciting blues artists like Bonamassa, mm -hmm. um, Gary Clark Jr. who are crossing over. They're almost not on the blues scene, they're on a whole other scene. Um, and that's brilliant because these are the artists who are bringing the blues back to younger people and to a bigger commercial audience. 
I think that's the key for the future of the blues. And it's something I'd love to see some of our BIM students doing, because we do have some very bluesy players here. Yeah, we do. Uh, it, the blues scene itself is brilliant. It's a wonderful community. You can make a living off of it. But I'm looking for that next person to cross it over to the mainstream, the way Joss Stone did with soul music and Jamie Cullen with jazz. That's, what, that's what's waiting to happen. Got another question here, which I, which I think is probably, uh, I don't know whether I should answer this. How can I get my music on TV? Well, yeah. I mean, I think that for me, the key thing is, I mean, one, be good. Mm -hmm. Two, put a really great showreel together. So think about that you, you can go on YouTube and you can download uh, trailers without the music on. Practice doing that. They're, they're three, make sure you're on LinkedIn. Once you're good enough and you've, you, you've practiced and practiced and you've studied and analyzed what makes TV and film music work, then put that showreel together and, and do your hard work, do the research, find out who the, who, who the people are that you need to send it to, who are the music supervisors, and a lot of them are on LinkedIn. And you know, write a personalised email, say, oh, I really love the music you put on that Dulux advert. Um, you know, if, you're, if you get a moment, would you listen, mm -hmm. come and look at my showreel? I mean, to be honest, people are always asking about the music industry, how do you get in it? I think if you come to a place like this, you're already in it, mm -hmm. to be honest. But, it's, it, but there, there is no magic sugared pill to make things happen. You, just, you, you have to do the research. Yeah. Um, and there are worse things. You could be stacking shelves in Tesco's. Um, uh, mm -hmm. We've got a question here, which I'm going to throw back at you, Danny. How important is it to have a USP or a specific brand? I think it's really important um, because there's a lot of competition out there and you need to find out what's special about you and makes you stand out. Um, not just for the sake of the music, but from a marketing perspective and to promote yourself to industry professionals. Why should this venue or promoter book you over the next person? And uh, why should a record label sign you over the next person? With me, um, I remember telling uh, Roof Records when I was in touch with them in 2006 that I wanted, as a 20-year-old as a blues artist then, to take the blues and cross it over to the mainstream. Um, and and I had a, I'd put a lot of work into my image, Joss Stone-esque kind of hippie image, um, and sh she was bigger then, so it made more sense. And um, yeah, that was something that excited them. They thought, okay, this is what we need for the future of the blues, somebody who can do that. Mm -hmm. As it is, I haven't done that. But it, it really worked for me, you know, I've toured on the blues scene, I haven't been the next Joss Stone. But it was something that made me stand out. Um, and even now, the, the more recent record deal I've just signed, it was, you, you've got to think not just about um, what kind of uh, pushing what, what's wonderful about me so much as what can I do for you in your business. So to say to the record label, um, firstly, be really sweet about it. Tell them what you love about them and their artists. Make you know, be friendly and kind. Um, but secondly, I remember with uh, my most recent record deal saying, "Well, you haven't got many British acts, and I would like to represent your label in Britain as a British blues artist." You know, that's yeah. what was special about me compared to their other artists this time. So yeah, really think about USP. Well, I think also from an artistic point of view. Not, I mean, there are good, like you say, there are, there are many, many good commercial reasons for having that mm -hmm. USP, for sticking out, for having a niche. But also, just artistically, who wants to make records yeah. for other people and write songs that other people have done before? It's true. Um, you know, sometimes it is just about finding finding that, that one thing, that, that, that ingredient that nobody else has ever put into music. You know, being like Heston Blumenthal, thinking, I know, I'm mm. going to make orange and pepper and turn it into sorbet. Uh, that's a terrible, forgive my terrible analogy, <laughs> but you, you get the point. It's about finding those ingredients and, and, and going, well, nobody's done this, so why yeah. the hell shouldn't I be the person to do it? I think you said something to me the other day, actually, about um, kind of big fish, small pond, mm -hmm. and, and how many, um, what was it? It was to do 10 pound a head. Oh, yeah, there's, <laughs> yeah, there, there, there's a, a, a maxim in the industry that if you've got, if you've got, say, 5,000 genuine fans, which mm. links to another question we had about number of followers, if you've got 5,000 fans, apparently 
If you're doing your job well, on average, they will spend £10 a head on you in a year. You don't need to be um, Stephen Hawking to work out that that's 50 grand. Mm. If your costs are 25 grand, you've made £25,000 in a year from 5,000 people. So in answer to the question I saw <laughs> that's now disappeared, it doesn't, how ah. big a following do you need to get noticed? There we go. Um, I, I <laughs> would say it's around that sort of number. When you get to that sort of number, people... It's amazing how many people appear, agents, managers, yeah. record companies, publishers, blah, 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 blah. But they all suddenly come out of the woodwork and go, oh, I've heard really good things about yeah. you. you know. um, yeah. let's, let's take another question, shall we? How easy is it to start your own label? Have you ever run your own label? Um, I've self-released on Bright Own Records as my label, but it's very different mm -hmm. to signing other artists to your label. So I wouldn't be able to answer that question from that perspective. I do have my own record company, and yeah. it's... it's do you know what? If you're selling, if you're selling records, you actually have a record company. Even if it's just like I've printed up CD, some CDs, mm -hmm. I've I've hand drawn the covers, I'm selling them at gigs. In essence, you're a record company. I mean, get a lot of advice because when it gets big and you start working with distributors, um, there are certain things you really, really don't want to muck up. So you yeah. know, you, you'll you'll have to know about how to create barcodes and ISDN codes and all the sort of boring mm -hmm. logistical stuff, but. In terms of starting, well, I mean, a lot of the great record companies, Creation Records, for instance, yeah. start Alan McGee sat in his kitchen with a stamp going, okay, number 1032, number 1033, and just selling them on market stalls. That's how Richard Branson started, although, yeah. you know, he has a terrible beard, so we won't talk about him anymore. <laughs> um, okay, what have we got here? I, uh, do you have any tips on figuring out what your sort of image stroke selling, but what your USP, what your niche is? Oh, uh, for, for image... That's an interesting one. Well, I mean, image and music, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I mean, your image needs to reflect your sound, really. So I think sound needs to be figured out first. Yeah. Um, and then it's worth doing your research into trying to find roughly the bracket that you fit into. And you might be thinking, well, I fit into several brackets, and that's probably a really good thing. That probably means you're doing something unique. But find the artists who are most similar to you and look at what, what, what do they wear? How do they stand for their photo shoots? What kind of guitars do they play? Because um, that's the kind of image that will be recognised by fans who love that genre. And then reconceptualise that. Do something new and different. Um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to add to that. I'm yes, going to then go to the, this, that bottom question there. But <laughs> in terms of finding, we have loads of students here who are in the process of finding their sound. It's a really common conversation I have with them. And sometimes it, it takes time, and it's about being not afraid to mm -hmm. try things. And not, you know, I, there's no such thing as a mistake when you're writing songs. I don't think it, it's. You might not decide to go down that particular path, but at least you've learned that's a path to not go down. Yeah. Uh, and and then, you know. You might try that one and try that one and try that one and eventually go, oh, this, this path here, this is the path for me. Yeah. Um, so it's, yeah. about, it's about trying stuff and not being too, not worrying too much about it because if you work hard, it will happen. You, That's you'll, true, yeah. You'll write a song that, um, that you suddenly realise that's the song. If I could add one more thing to that yeah. as well, actually, building on that. Um, being, uh, recognising your niche, as in if you are in a niche genre like, like myself, like blues or, or country or gospel and so on, um, if you, when you put your songs as a DIY artist doing it yourself online, maybe you use something like tunecore.com to make sure you can get your music on Amazon, iTunes, Spotify and so on, which is very cheap to do and you get all your royalties that way. Join PRS. Um, <laughs> anyway, back to the subject. If yeah. you do that, you actually get to pick what chart you go into. So for me, if I might have a pop blues song, but I'm going to predominantly say blues because if I go into the pop chart, I'm competing against Bruno Mars. I need to sell as many records as him to do well. If I go into the blues chart, I still need to sell a certain amount of records, but not nearly as many, especially of all the blues greats not being alive anymore. Um, so it's easier for you to be a big fish, small pond if you're in a niche genre. So it's worth thinking about. Yeah. Um Okay, I think we're going to have to wrap up. Listen, thank mm -hmm. you everybody for tuning in. That's, um, it's amazing that you've taken the time. Um, mm -hmm. I wish I could say hello to you all. If we have any questions that we've missed, uh, let us know and we'll try and get back to everybody. Um, and have yeah. a wonderful afternoon. Hope Enjoy the rain or the sun or whatever you're future. having. Take care all. Bye-bye.